Okay, welcome back. Uh, if you remember from our last video, we finished discussing the geography of the Middle East and North Africa. Now this presentation will cover Sub-Saharan Africa. In other words, countries south of the Saharan Desert. Now as stated before, the problem with world regions is really the lack in consensus on what constitutes a region. Now this is uh, especially prevalent in this part of the world. Now for this reason, if you look up Sub-Saharan Africa on the internet, you may get a number of results with different countries. Let's take a look at this map here. Uh, this map shows the countries that we will include in our discussion on this region. Now Sub-Saharan Africa can be divided, divided into four main sub-regions. West Africa contains uh, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Chad, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Benin, Togo, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Central Africa contains Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Congo, uh, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, East Africa contains Eritrea, Djibouti, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Madagascar. And finally, in Southern Africa, you have Angola, Zambia, Malawi, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, South Africa, Lesotho, and then finally Swaziland or Swaziland. Okay, so uh, the Physical geography plays a major role in the way society has developed in Sub-Saharan Africa, so it's important to go over some major physical attributes before we start this section. Now, located in the north of this region is the massive Sub-Saharan Desert here. Now between the, Sub the Saharan Desert and African Savannah is the Sahel, which is here. Uh, this region is a major grassland that is home to some of the oldest pastoral cattle herders in Africa. Now as discussed before, the Nile River, located here, uh, begins in uh, two separate locations uh, before it even combines in Khartoum, Sudan. The Blue Nile begins in Lake Tana in Ethiopia here, um, and the White Nile begins in Lake Victoria, which is located here uh, in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Now the East African Rift Valley, shown here, is an amazing landscape feature that cuts through Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. Now the Congo River Basin, located here, is uh, in Central Africa and is home to the Congo Rainforest and thousands of species of plants and animals. Finally, the Kalahari Desert here to the south is similar to the Sahara and is considered a tropical hot desert due to its latitude around the Tropic of Capricorn. Okay, so before we get started, let's watch this quick clip from National Geographic titled, Protecting Africa's Wild Coast. Gabon, rich in natural splendor, with a proud history of conservation to protect its lands. but its waters are largely unknown and unexplored. In 2012, an expedition by the Waite Institute, the National Geographic Society, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and Parks Gabon set out to discover what lay beyond Gabon's shores. Good. Good to go. And revealed unknown treasures to match the beauty and diversity of the land, sometimes in unexpected places.
President Bongo saw this unique opportunity for protection and decided to create a system of marine national parks, extending the protected areas on land into Gabon's waters. Yeah, our job is just cut out for us, you know. This is a historic first for Africa and an incredible example for the world to follow. So, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is really an extraordinary place and I had the wonderful opportunity to visit in uh, visit Tanzania in 2014 to participate in some economic research. Now hopefully I can share some of my experiences um, in this presentation. Uh, the natural features of this region may have begun when Pangaea split into two supercontinents known as Gondwanaland and Laurasia. Now the massive shifts in landforms over the past 200 million years have resulted in a number of interesting physical features in Sub-Saharan Africa, the most interesting of which uh, are the East African Rift Valley, a series of volcanoes and craters in East Africa, the Great Lakes region, and finally Mount Kilimanjaro. Now, according to the continental drift hypothesis around 225 million years ago, all land was combined into a supercontinent called Pangaea. During the Triassic period around 200 million years ago, the north half began to split away from the southern half forming two supercontinents called Laurasia and Gondwanaland. Now Laurasia uh, was uh, a super active area and would eventually form North America and Eurasia. And you can get a better view of that here. The central base of Gondwanaland would form Africa. The western half would form South America and the southern portion would eventually become India, Antarctica, and Australia. Now Africa is considered the central base of the ancient supercontinents. Therefore, it is really the origin point for all continents. If the continental drift hypothesis is true, then Africa has been relatively stationary for 225 million years, which would explain its lack of any major mountain ranges. Unfortunately, there are several problems with uh, Alfred Wagner's continental drift hypothesis that have really not uh, have have been able to unable to stand the test of time so you'll have to take some of these descriptions with a grain of salt now this map shows global tectonic plates um, I only show this map because the African plate sits at the center of tectonic movement because of this completely theoretical uh, theor uh, because of it, its completely theoretical nature uh, seismologists disagree as to the size and scope of the African plate uh, some geologists argue that it is actually two plates that are diverging, while others argue it's one plate that is expanding. Now you'll notice that there are three lines located here on the eastern half of Africa. These lines represent the East African Rift Valley. Now the East African Rift is an active continental rift zone in East Africa. It, is, uh, it began developing around the onset of the Miocene period between 22 and 25 million years ago. The rift, a narrow zone, is a, developing, is a developing divergent tectonic plate boundary where the African plate is in the process of splitting into two tectonic plates uh, called the Somali plate and the Nubian plate at a rate of about 6 to 7 millimeters annually. Now you can see the impact of the diverging plate on the map uh, to the to the right, uh, or excuse me, to the left. This is the digital elevation model of East Africa, and you can see the Rift Valley that has been cut out of the landscape moving from north to south along the map located here. It appears that somebody's actually dug into the ground from above. On the map on the right, uh, this outlines the uh, Rift Valley in red, as you can see here. Uh, the thick orange line represents the new boundary between the two halves of the African plate, as you can see it moving from north to south here. Notice that the East African Rift Valley is not just one rift valley, but actually a series of valleys that form major lakes in the region here. Now this satellite image gives you a better view of the impact of this rift valley. Because of this tectonically active region, a number of lakes, volcanoes, and craters have formed. 
Now the large circular lake located here is Lake Victoria. This linear lake um, in the bottom left is Lake Tanganyika. And uh, these linear landforms moving from north to south that look like scratches, as you can see here, um, it are the resulting rift valleys from this expanding plate. Now, this slide gives a more concise definition of rift valleys. As the slide states, rift valleys are long, narrow bands of down-dropped blocks caused by plates being pulled apart. Now, what makes the African rift valley so unusual is that the African plate isn't diverging away from another plate like other rift valleys. In fact, the African plate is expanding, forcing the plate to be ripped apart. As the pliable lithosphere begins to stretch apart, land located near the center of the plate drops in elevation, creating this linear valley along the newly emerged plate boundary. Now this picture in the bottom left is an aerial photograph of the East, East African Rift Valley. Now this map in the center here is a hypothetical map of the future. Some geologists believe that the resulting split in the African plate will allow oceanic water to flow into the valley and eventually the continent will split in two. Now, of course, the map on the right here uh, shows the East African Rift Valley that uh, valleys that have resulted from the diverging plate. As you can see, the rift valleys have created a series of lakes throughout the region. Here, Lake Tinkanika, Lake Victoria, Lake Malawi. Now, these lakes are also believed to be where humans originated, as the oldest skeletons have been discovered along these lakes. Now in 2014 I had the opportunity to travel to Tanzania for some economic research and I was comparing uh, economic growth in Arusha, Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar to, anal uh, to analyze the different factors in growth and population migration patterns. Uh, while I was there I visited several major landforms and, and stayed in a Maasai village for several days. Uh, while while there my group visited the East African Rift Valley. Now this picture here um, I took while I was there. Notice the linear cliffs located here in the picture. Now the area in the bottom of the picture has been pulled away from the land on the top part of the picture, forming these ridges that you can see in the center of this photograph. Now this region has is also volcanically active Forces under the lith lithosphere have resulted in the creation of these pockets of magma beneath the surface. Now when plate, uh, plate movements occur, the magma is forced to surface and uh, the result, this results in the creation of stratovolcanoes, also known as composite volcanoes. Now a volcano occurs, occurs when molten rock erupts from the Earth's surface and results in the creation of new lithosphere. Stratovolcanoes, like the ones shown here, in this picture and here in this picture, are explosive and emit amounts of lava, ash, and pyroclastic flow resulting in the sandy surface you see in both of these pictures. Now the volcano, these are the same volcanoes but from different angles, um, is Oldonio Lungai. The interesting thing about this volcano is that when it erupted in 2017, the magma chamber wasn't actually underneath the volcano. Um, so when it erupted, magma moved laterally under the surface up through the mouth of the volcano here. Once the magma chamber was empty, the cre it, created, uh, the, uh, it created this crater located next to the volcano as, uh, as the magma chamber could no longer support the surface above it. Now, Old Donio Lingai is known by the local Maasai people as the, quote, mountain of God, as it destroys but brings life. In 2007, this volcano erupted and decimated the landscape, forcing the Maasai tribe, pictured in the bottom here, uh, to move. Now, they were able to return shortly, and the fertile ash prompted the growth of new grass for their cattle to graze on. Now you'll notice in the picture on the bottom left here that the crater collapsed in the circle here because this was really the direction that the ash had erupted. Now this, notice the grassland surrounding the volcano in this picture. This is recent growth since its eruption in 2007. Now the picture in the upper right shows the vent and crater located here and the ash layer below. 
The picture in the bottom right shows, of course, my friend here, Robbie, participating in a traditional fertility dance with this local Maasai tribe. <clears throat> Let's watch this uh, short video from Al Jazeera. I'll expand this a little bit. Um, it's presenting some interesting information about Old Donia Lingai. Towering above everything else around the Lake Nachon area in northern Tanzania, Oldonyo Lenkai stands at more than 7,000 feet. The local Maasai community call it the Mountain of God. For the last two years, it's been rumbling. Geologists are monitoring its activity more intently because of a recent scare an eruption was imminent. That threat level has since diminished, but scientists say nothing can be left to chance. Hanson Kotago is professor at the University of Dar es Salaam's geology department. He says Tanzania needs a working observatory center to be able to keep a closer eye on the mountain itself rather than getting information from other countries' experts. It has been unfortunate that even Olonyolenga itself can tell you people from Germany, Europe, they have more information because they have been working there at the mountain there than we do. These guys, they know much more scientifically than what we have. Why? Because they have money. This is the world's only active volcano that bulges out black lava rich with a type of rock called carbonatite. When it comes to contact with moisture, it turns white. Volcanic eruptions have been recorded here since 1883. The largest deposited ash 100 kilometers away. And that's a concern because the mountain is also close to important ancient historic sites, like this one on the southern shores of Lake Natron, named the Dance Floor. Early modern human footprints left between 5 and 19,000 years ago and preserved by debris and ash from the volcano. Those who live on the foothills of the mountain have watched in awe and fear the mountain of God rode to life. This mountain last erupted in 2007. Those who live here say it had loudly rumbled for months before. And when it finally spewed its lava, they ran for cover. No one died, but some lost their cattle and grazing grounds were destroyed. Ngarosai Kingi says it sounded like a thunderstorm and describes the flowing lava as scary. I was afraid at first. I thought I choked to death. It was like a fire. Then it cooled down and became white. The dust settled on our cattle, and when we tried to get it off the animals, it would peel off the skin. Hassan Marias Kingi told us immediately it happened. He knew what to do in line with the culture of his community. The elders and I took a bull and slaughtered it on top of the mountain. That same day, God listened to us, and the lava stopped. I don't know what we had done to offend him. Communities here believe this volcano is sacred. They say they're not worried because like their ancestors, they know just what to do when the mountain of God rose again. Catherine Soy, Al Jazeera, on the foothills of El Doño Lenkai. So the East African Rift Valley has also resulted in the creation of a region called the Great Lakes. Now, as the plate began to split apart 200 million years ago, the resulting collapse, uh, collapsed landscape would fill up with rain, rainwater and turn into massive lakes. Now, these lakes would feed the first species of humans called the Australopithecus afarensis. Lake Albert, Lake Edward, Lake Kivu, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Victoria, Lake Turkana, Lake Bukwa, uh, Mweru, uh, Malawi, uh, make up the largest lakes in this region and feed millions of people today. And as you can see from this map located here, and we can also get a better, better view of that over here, uh, this is what constitutes that Great Lake region, which is formed based on the East African Rift that's formed over millions of years. Uh, another important feature caused by seismic activity in East Africa is the largest mountain in Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro. This mountain sits on the border of Tanzania and Kenya and is uh, approximately 19,341 feet above sea level. We can find this here. There is Mount Kilimanjaro. And we zoom back out and you can see it on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. 
Now the Mount Kilimanjaro is actually a confluence of three volcanic cones called Kibo, Mawenzi, and Shira. Now this mountain is considered dormant, which means that it has not erupted in recent history, but may erupt sometime in the future. Now this picture here uh, was taken during my visit in May of 2014. Kilimanjaro is somewhere in this photo, but difficult to see. Local residents uh, have a saying that if you see Kilimanjaro in May, that God is looking down on you. Now they say that because during May, moist air from the Indian Ocean enters this portion of Tanzania and creates fog throughout the region. The fog is so thick that it hides Kilimanjaro. Now when I was on a bus back to Dar es Salaam, the driver noticed the peak of Kilimanjaro peering over the clouds. When I, took, when I looked up, I couldn't find it, but I took a picture anyways. Now once I took the picture, I finally saw it. The mountain is so tall that I wasn't looking high enough. Uh, if you look at the break in the clouds at the center of the picture, you can see part of the mountain peering above the clouds right here. As you can see, portions of, the of, the, of Kilimanjaro peer above the clouds. Now I guess I was fortunate enough to have God looking down on me. Now because of its massive size and location, Sub-Saharan Africa has several of the major climate zones across the landscape. The ITCZ plays a major role in the creation of these climate zones, and because of its relatively flat landscape, most of Africa's climate zones follow the major latitudinal zones. These different climates are also a major source of income as ecotourism brings in millions of dollars to places like Tanzania. Of course, development in Sub-Saharan Africa and a growing population has led to some environmental degradation across the region. Desertification, deforestation, and soil erosion has, been, uh, has devastated many of these countries in this part of the world. And because of poor soil, many parts of Africa, it has been unable to recover from some of that degradation. Let's see if we can get a better view of this. As stated in other videos, the ITCZ is a major force for climate development. This linear region of rain follows the sun's rays and, seasons, uh, and seasonal changes, and it brings much needed precipitation to much of sub-Saharan Africa. Now in January, the ITCZ, as shown in this map here, cuts across southern Africa, bringing in seasonal rains, and in July, it moves to the northern portion of Sub-Saharan Africa to bring rains to the savanna climate in the north, here. Now there are five main climate biomes in Sub-Saharan Africa. However, this map does not do really a great job of showing the differences within the region. So you should keep in mind that even with, within these regions, climates are very different across space. Now tropical rainforests are located near the equator, as you can see here and have two major rainy seasons in the spring and fall. Now these rainy seasons are associated with, uh, with the ITCZ movement uh, moving overhead with the sun's direct rays. Now this region is also associated with canopy forests that develop due to the large amounts of rain. Temperatures are fairly stable in this region as well. Now tropical savanna regions uh, surround the tropical rainforest biome and generally have one long rainy season during the summer. As you can see these regions here located around this tropical rainforest. Now this region is extremely diverse and may consist of thick forests or shrublands uh, with sparse trees. Uh, temperatures are generally fairly stable all year. Now the steppe borders the savanna and uh, desert regions and is located with short seasonal rains. Now, this is also a diverse region and can have shrublands and sparse trees or grasslands. Temperatures vary between seasons and aren't uniform throughout the region. As you can see, the steppe is represented in yellow located here. Now deserts are located near the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. They are associated with very short rainy, uh, seasonal rains, if they get any, and have uh, large areas of sandy spaces with sparse plant life. You can see that represented here in this sort of rust red um, in the Sahara and in the Kalahari in the south. Now as with other highland areas, temperatures, land cover, and precipitation vary greatly across space 
and are highly dependent on elevation. Now this slide shows uh, climographs for selected cities in different biomes. The graph on the upper left here shows the climate of Lambarn, Gabon, which is considered to be a tropical wet climate because of its rainfall patterns and stable temperatures. Notice that the average temperatures range from 27 to 28 degrees Celsius throughout the year, as you can see here in the purple. Lambarn's rainy season occurs in fall and spring of each year, as you can see here in uh, both sides of the graph. Now Timbuktu, Mali, is shown in the upper right. This is considered a steppe climate because of its shrub vegetation, short summer rain, and yearly temperature ranges. Now this is an interesting area because you'll notice that temperatures increase from 22 to 35 Celsius in just five months, but dip down to 30 when the rainy season occurs. Now Maputo, Mozambique in the bottom left here is considered a tropical savanna climate with thick forests, long monsoon seasons in the summer, as you can see here, and a relatively small range in seasonal temperatures. Finally, uh, Bilma Niger is considered a hot desert because of its hot summer temperatures and a lack of any major seasonal precipitation. Uh, it receives most of its precipitation in August with an average of 7.1 millimeters of rain, as you can see here in the center of the graph. Now, the next few pictures, I'll go back here, the next few pictures from one, uh, are from one of the biomes in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this first picture is a tropical rainforest. Contrary to popular belief, the canopy does not stop smaller trees and bushes from growing underneath. While tropical rainforests do have less vegetation on the forest floor, they still, um, they still have thick and often, uh, thick, they still are thick and are often difficult to walk through. Now this second picture is a tropical savanna. Savannas vary greatly across space and can often be indistinguishable from rainforest. However, this picture shows the general characteristics of a savanna. I took this picture in 2014 and as you can see, there are a number of trees, but growth is rather thin and dominated by grasslands, as you can see here. Now this Show, this picture shows the landscape of a steppe biome. Steppes are mostly grassland, but also have some trees and bushes. This picture is another example of a tropical savanna. I took this picture in 2014 as well, and it shows major tree growth here and here in the distance. Um, and it also shows major, uh, major undergrowth. Now this was just 15 miles from the other picture I took of the African savanna. Now finally, this picture is a hot desert in North Africa. Very little vegetation occurs in the Sahara Desert, and when it does, it usually consists of small trees located here and bushes located here. Now the soil is dominated by sand and has very little nutritional value. Now the beautiful climate and biodiversity in Sub-Saharan Africa has resulted in the growth of ecotourism. Ecotourism is, uh, is uh, is essentially tourism directed toward exotic, often threatened natural environments intended to support conservation efforts and observe wildlife. Now this picture shows Ngora Ngora Crater in Tanzania. It attracts thousands of tourists each year as of two, and as of 2017, tourism alone accounted for 9% of Tanzania's GDP. Now I took the next few pictures while I was on a safari in 2014. Now this picture shows a Cape Buffalo. These animals are quite abundant in this region. This picture shows a family of zebras on a nice warm summer day relaxing. Now this picture shows a society of flamingos. Now unfortunately I couldn't get close enough to get a better picture. Now these birds congregate in this lake um, within the crater and get their pink color from the food they eat. Now this is just a closer picture. It's just a zoom uh, picture from this particular photograph. And it shows uh, thousands of these flamingos congregating in this lake. Now this picture is of the lake within the Ngorongora crater. Several hippos were actually bathing in this picture when we visited. 
Now, when I took this picture, I didn't realize that hippos were violent. Now, as I walked away, I spoke with my guide about the hippos, and that's when I found out that they are known for killing people that get too close. Now, the picture on the left is a female lion, and the picture on the right is a termite colony. These termites are massive compared to American termites and can cause some major damage. Now, despite biodiversity and the beautiful environment in Africa, this region is currently going through some environmental challenges. Desertification is occurring at an alarming rate in the Sahel, which borders the Savannah and the Sahara Desert. You can see this area in the red, in the dark red on this map to the left. The red represents areas with very high vulnerability for desertification. Now locations with the highest vulnerability are often grasslands used for cattle grazing. If we go to Google Maps, we might get a better view of this. The Sahel is this sort of uh, shaded region between the savanna here and the desert here. And it's marked by grasslands, which you can see partially here. This area is mostly used, again, by pastoral people for cattle grazing. Now, plantation agriculture in the rainforest has resulted in deforestation in many areas. You'll notice in the map on the upper right, uh, this shows net deforestation and the largest areas impacted by plantation agriculture are in West Africa, in Benin, Togo, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, and Sierra Leone located here. Now there are also other areas that have high net deforestations such as the Democratic Republic of the Congo located here. Now plantation agriculture has also resulted in an increase in soil erosion which has polluted major rivers in, with pesticide. Because of the lack of nutrient rich soil many of these areas with dramatic soil erosion have been unable to grow food, which has led to, the, uh, led to an increase in food insecurity in many areas. Now, the physical environment of Sub-Saharan sub Africa has uh, played a major role in the development of historical societies in European colonial and eventually European colonialism. Now, because of time, we only have we only we're only going to be able to discuss the major points in historical development of this region. Now anthropologists have been on extensive digs in East Africa and discovered that this may be the region where humans first developed. The first humans, uh, the first human, i.e. Lucy the Australopithecus afarensis, was discovered in 1974 in the Awash Valley of Ethiopia. Other early humans have been found throughout, the, throughout several countries in East Africa, leading some scholars to conclude that this region is where life began for people. Early societies also thrived in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, contrary to popular opinions by European explorers. The Bantu migration between 1000 BC and 500 AD would lead to the spread of the Swahili and Bantu culture across the continent. Societies such as the kingdoms of, of Kush and Aksum thrived in northeast Africa between 700 BC and 100 AD, and the Ghana, Mali, and Songhai empires would build massive trading empires in West Africa between 500 and 1500 AD. Now, between 500 and 1400 AD, Arab slave traders would buy and sell East Africans for slave labor in parts of the Arabic empire. Uh, and India. Now this would have a profoundly negative impact in societal development in East Africa. Now with the introduction of European powers prior to the Berlin Conference in 1884, the remaining societies across Sub-Saharan Africa would disappear. The Berlin Conference only solidified European control in this region. Finally, there is a legacy of colonialism today that keeps Africa from developing their own in, in their own independent ways. Now, as stated earlier, anthropologists believe that the earliest hominids originated in East Africa, and as the map on the right shows, a number of discoveries have led scholars to conclude that the predecessors to modern humans evolved in Africa. The oldest human discoveries 
uh, to this date is the Australopithecus afarensis, also called Lucy. She was discovered by Donald Johansson in the Awash Valley of Ethiopia in 1974. Radiocarbon dating reveals Lucy to be approximately 3.7 million years old. Now I had the chance to visit the site of the third oldest hominid discovered in Africa known as the Zendrothropus. The Zendrothropus bones were discovered in 1959 by Louis Leakey when he visited the Old Dubai Gorge shown in the map on the bottom left. The skeletal picture in the middle here is the skull of the Zendrothropus hominid. It's believed that the Old Dubai hominid is roughly 1.7 million years old and at the time of, of this discovery was the oldest bones discovered. So if we fast forward 1.7 million years, scholars have argued that a massive migration of Bantu people began around 3000 BC and continued until around 500 AD. Now the Bantu people may have originated along the Benue and Niger rivers, but would expand eastward through the rainforests and savannas, possibly due to war, famine, or drought. Now beginning around 500 AD, Arabs migrated to East Africa and had children with these Bantu people along the coast. Now the mixture of ethnicities and languages would create the Swahili language, which is spoken by a major portion of people in Sub-Saharan Africa today. Now, the picture on the bottom left shows a group of Arabs. That uh, Arabs. Now, these people would intermarry with Bantu people and create the people shown here in this picture on the right. Now, these are ethnically mixed people that speak Swahili and practice Islam. Now, the people on the left here are the indigenous peoples of East Africa, known as the Maasai. Now, these people live in modern Kenya and Tanzania, but make up a minority of the population. Because, of their, because much of their land has been seized by the governments of Kenya and Tanzania. And many of them have been forced to relocate or assimilate into society. We can actually take a look over here and get an idea of where these people are located. Now on my trip there, I had a chance to spend several weeks with these people living in their community. Now where we were located was here near Arusha. So these people migrate across the border between these two countries and they make up a large portion of the pastoral peoples that live in both southern Kenya and northern Tanzania. Let's take a second and watch this quick video clip from Jared, Jared Diamond titled GGS Bantu and Ancient Africa. Even today the continent of Africa is composed of thousands of different tribal groupings. Each is subtly distinct from the next in custom and language. Such diversity means that most Africans have to master more than one language and they acquire those skills at a very young age. I would like to find out how many languages you speak. Who here speaks, knows how to speak Bemba? Aha! Does anybody else know how to understand or speak Lozi? You speak Lozi? Yes. Do you also speak Bemba? Is there another language that you speak also? Lova. Lova. That's four languages. That's good. Most Americans speak only one language. After a little exposure to these different languages, you begin to realize one thing. They all sound remarkably similar. I'm fascinated with languages, and wherever I've been going, I'm asking Africans, what's your language, and tell me some words in your language. So here's what I found out for the word for sun. In the Nyanja language, sun is Zuba. In the Bemba language, it's Aka Zuba. In Chiwa, it's Duzuba. And in the Sengu language, it's Zuba again. Or the word for water. In the Nyanja language, it's Manzi. 
and in Bemba it's Anenshi, and in Chiwa it's Manzi, similar to each other again. What do these linguistic similarities tell us? That there is a common root for most of the modern languages of tropical Africa, a single ancestral language spoken by a single group of people from which the many languages of today have descended. Linguistic analysis has isolated a family of languages known as Bantu, which originated in tropical West Africa. About 5,000 years ago, the early Bantu speakers began to spread into new lands, bringing their crops, their animals, and their language with them. And over centuries, Bantu culture evolved, diversifying into hundreds of tribes, expanding across the tropical region of Africa. But the truth of this pan-African civilization was suppressed for many years. Dr. Alex Skirman is trying to overturn the legacy of South Africa's racist past. She has been excavating an archaeological site on the banks of the Limpopo River. In the early part of the 20th century, um, there were rumors in the white South African community about this place, in their minds linked to the Queen of Sheba or some other early white civilization in Southern Africa, trying to show that the Phoenicians or the Sabaeans, basically anybody who was a bit lighter skinned than Africans, were here first and they found the opposite, that Africans actually had an amazing great history and that they had earlier states um, running before, way before um, any white set foot in Africa. This site, known as Mapungubwe, the place of the jackal, formed the heart of a kingdom similar to the earliest civilizations in Europe. It was the capital of a massive state, um, about 5,000 people living around this hill. But then you had several thousand other people living in the valley who produced the agricultural surplus to feed the city or town. They had cattle, they had sheep, they grew sorghum, millet, they worked iron. It was a massive amazing development that occurred in Southern Africa. And this was not an isolated state. It formed part of a much larger economic network that had spread across Southern Africa and beyond. These are Mapungubwe beads. They're gorgeous blue ones. These are glass beads that came down the Indian Ocean coast. Um, and through them, we know that Mapungu was part of the international trade network, um, linking it all the way to the coast. It's an incredible African accomplishment to set up such a complex trade network that links all the way into northern Botswana, bringing material from there and taking it all the way to the Indian Ocean coast. So there's a, uh, an amazing history that's been relatively hidden and unknown to us for over a thousand maybe 2,000 years that we're only beginning now to somewhat understand. And I look forward to the future to figuring, to finding out more information about this Bantu migration that may not have been just a migration. It may have been a massive society based on similar ruins that have been found and geoglyphs that have been found around the continent of Africa. Now, while the Bantu people were migrating across Central Africa, a powerful empire was developing in southern portion of the Nile located in modern-day Sudan. 
This group was known as the Nubian Civilization and would later rename themselves the Kush Empire. Now, after the decline and fall of the Egyptian Empire, the Kush Empire from Southern Nile region moved north and continued the pyramid building culture. This empire would carry on the tradition of the Egyptians from around 785 BC until 350 AD. Now, as you can see from the map on the left here, the Kush Empire would take control of most of the former Egyptian Empire and extend its reach into Sudan. Now, the picture in the upper middle of the slide shows pyramids based, uh, built by the Kush. Now, during the sharp decline of the Kush Empire, the Aksum Empire, pictured here in this map on the right, would begin to develop along the basin of the Blue Nile in modern Ethiopia. As the slide says at the bottom, the Aksum Empire is ancient, but probably originated in 100 AD. They built a trading empire with Rome in modern Ethiopia. They also built obelisks and massive Christian churches. The Aksum Empire would eventually become Ethiopia and is considered the oldest Christian state. Some people believe that the Ark of the Covenant brought to Israel during the Exodus is stored in the church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Aksum, Ethiopia. Now you can see this church pictured here in the center. <clears throat> now while the Aksum Empire was blossoming in Ethiopia, the Empire of Ghana was developing in modern day Mali. The, this slide says that a series of empires developed in West Africa beginning in the 600s. Ghana was the first to establish economic ties with the Arab traders in approximately 700 AD. After Ghana's decline in 1000, trade continued but was controlled by tribal villages. Mali tribesmen would, control, uh, would take control of Timbuktu and other villages in 1200, and the Mali Empire was born. The greatest of the West African trading empires was the Songhai. They built a massive empire based on wealth from, Arab, uh, from Arabs between 1468 and 1737. Now to get a better idea of the territory, we can look at the map here on the left. It shows the development of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai in West Africa. Mali would establish Islam as its official religion and Songhai would follow suit. Songhai would develop in the ruins of Mali and continue their architectural wonders. Now, they would uh, base their power out of Timbuktu as well, as this was the final stop for many of the Arab goods being transported from North Africa. Now, the picture on the top right here is the Larambanga Mosque located in Larambanga, Ghana. It was probably finished around 1421, but may have also been built earlier. This picture here uh, is the Great Mosque of Jinn, uh, located in Mali. It was probably built uh, as far back as 1200 um, and 1300, but uh, may have been started earlier. Now, during the rise of the Ghana Empire in the west and the end of the last Bantu migration, Arabs began settling um, uh, setting up extensive trading empires uh, along the eastern coast of Africa. Now this slide says that between 500 and 1500 AD, Arabs had expanded down the coast of East Africa, spreading uh, language and Islam. They interbred with the Bantu people, creating Swahili. Slaves were the primary commodity of, uh, and many of them were sold into the South Asian markets. Bagamoyo and Zanzibar were major port cities for slaves. The British would eventually outlaw slavery in East Africa in 1886. Today, Zanzibar reflects the mixture of Bantu, Arab, and British uh, settlements throughout the centuries. Now, the map on the left here shows the major Arab trade routes in red and major Arab and Islamic states written in bold uppercase. The, Sultan, the Sultanate of Zanzibar was a major docking point for goods and slaves sold out of East Africa. So here is, if we zoom back out, we can see this is Africa. Zoom in to Zanzibar, located off the coast of the major port city in modern-day Tanzania. Zanzibar, it was a major transportation hub for slaves. Now the picture on the bottom right here is the slave market and courthouse used to sell slaves to India and Arabia located in Stonetown, Zanzibar. Now the invention of the triangular sale by Arab traders pictured here um, 
allowed traders and fishermen uh, easy transportation of goods and people across the Indian Ocean um, and through the Persian Gulf. Now the two pictures on the top of the page here um, were taken when I visited Bwagamoya located near Dar es Salaam on the coast of Tanzania. Now this was the last stop for many of the people as they were being sold into slavery. Let's see if we can find that here. There is modern day Bagamoyo, originally called Bwagamoya. Now Bwagamoya translates roughly into lay down your hearts, which reflects the sad history of this place. It would be the last time many of these people would see their families, so they must lay down their hearts. Now the Arab slave trade would be followed by the European slave trade in West Africa between 1500s, uh, beginning in the 1500s. Now within 350 years, Europe would institute a plan to control all resources in sub-Saharan Africa. In 1884, a group of European colonial powers met in Berlin and divided Africa up according to current holdings and geographic features. They paid no attention to ethnic differences. Now the conference decreed that European countries could colonize only if they had treaties with locals, flew their flag, and also created government administrations for the territory. So what was the purpose? Africa was filled with an abundance of resources such as coal, oil, natural gas, precious metals, and diamonds. The Berlin Conference would have lasting effects on Africa that impacts their development even to this day. Now, current boundaries and borders reflect the Berlin Conference and have resulted in irredentism and ethnic conflict. Colonialism has resulted in the rise of neocolonialism and the resource curse, which we will discuss in the next video presentation. Now, a, a particular important study case is the Rwandan Genocide. The Rwandan Genocide occurred in 1994 when a civil war broke out between the controlling minority, the Hutu, um, when they slaughtered almost one million moderate Hutus and Tutsis. Uh, borders in Rwanda would create, uh, were created based on physical boundaries, not cultural boundaries. This, had, this ended up leading to uh, the disenfranchisement of the majority, pop, majority of the population at the hands of the ruling minority. Now if you look at the map on the right over here, it shows ethno-linguistic groups um, in Africa overlaid with current borders. Now the very borders that were drawn by Europeans. Notice that these borders and ethnic boundaries don't match. This is a technique used to divide ethnic groups and make it easier to control their societies. Now, the Europe, uh, Europe and the United States and China uh, have taken advantage of this instability in the region and uh, to this day they continue to control many of these governments. Okay, so that's about all the time we have for today. We will pick up uh, the legacy of colonialism and the rise of neocolonialism in the next presentation. So thanks for watching and please stay safe and have a great day.